Okay, everyone, welcome to Exploring Our Bugs. I'm Ben Cotton, the Fedora Program Manager. Um, before we get into the, the meat of the talk, I do wanna share a little bit of housekeeping notes. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. This talk, which is linked in the Hopin chat, if you're watching live as this is happening, um, uh, the slides are there. This talk is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 license. So do with it what you will, subject to those license. Um, if you have nice things to say, which include like, you know, constructive criticism, like I know I'm not perfect. Uh, that's my, there's my Twitter handle. It's also on every slide. If you have not nice things to say, you are, of course, welcome to keep those to yourself. Um, I will ask for questions at the end. Hopefully we'll have time. I uh, did cut a lot of slides out of this to make room. Uh, so feel free to use the Q&A tab. I'm going to try and ignore the chat unless it's to say, hey, Ben, your audio has fallen apart, in which case I'll refresh real quick in the mid middle of the talk. So what is this talk? Well, it's kind of what it says. It's a look at the bugs filed from Fedora Linux 19 through Fedora Linux 34. And you might say, why that range? And the answer is um, Fedora Linux 19 was the first one where we used the end of life closure on bugs. And so that really felt like a good sort of modern era uh, of starting point. We could certainly go all the way back to Fedora Core 1, um, but just because we've handled things differently over time, it might make comparisons a little hard to, uh, you know, to really draw conclusions from. And of course, Fedora Linux 34 is the most recently end of life version. Um, I stuck with those because it's a lot easier to get the CSV file when all the bugs are closed and theoretically they will remain that way. And then to try and, you know, dynamically redo this uh, every few weeks with, with our open bugs. Um, if you watched last year's talk, you know, you'll remember that I excluded Rawhide. Now, some of the graphs have Rawhide, and I'll talk a bit more at the end about um, the future incorporating Rawhide bugs. Uh, but for now, some of them do. I think I've called them all out when Rawhide is included. Um, but like last year's version, um, this is really based on curiosity, not convincing. Um, I wanted to look at, like, what do we see from the Bugzilla data um, and what kind of kind of conclusions can we draw? I didn't really come into it with like, I want to prove to the community that we should, you know, whatever. Um, and I think this is probably going to ask more questions than it answers, although maybe not explicitly, but it should be at least get us thinking about things as opposed to saying, you know, prescriptively what we should do. So with some quick notes on Rawhide. Um, Right now, the Jupyter Notebook, which there's a link to on the last slide, um, Rawhide is separate. As I started working on this, I realized there are actually a lot of places where I'm basically making the same thing, just one with Rawhide and one without. So in the uh, post-Nest deep breath moment um, before the you know, release process really starts ramping up in like four days, um, I'll probably go through and consolidate that into one notebook um, so that people can share it and do their own uh, analysis or, you know, interpretation anyway. Um, but the way I lumped the rawhide bugs in with a release is it's basically based on branch dates. Um, and so, like, there's a little bit of edge case, like, you know, did the bug get closed before or after that particular bug got branched? Because it takes time to iterate through all of them. Um, for what we're doing here, we don't need that level of precision. And like I said... Not all of the data uh, and the graphs and the tables and stuff will include Rawhide. All right, so let's look at stuff. Some basic things are like, how many bug reports do we get per release? That seems like the most obvious question to ask. Um, and as you can see, we had a lot and then kind of dropped and now it's coming back up again. And you might be like, oh no, we're getting a lot more bug reports, but um, Carl Vogel, in his book, uh, Producing Open Source Software, which is a great book, um, says, an accessible bug database is one of the strongest signs that a project should be taken seriously. And the higher the number of bugs in the database, the better the project looks. Um, basically, the more people who are using Fedora Linux, the more bugs they're going to find and report. So the fact that we're seeing a rise 
um, is potentially a good thing, especially because really I feel like starting with Fedora Linux 32 and continuing up through the present, that's really when we started seeing some of that organic positive press um, from a lot of the Linux enthusiast groups. Um, so this really does sort of intuitively correlate to that. All right, so now let's add in Rawhide. Um, so just kind of looking at it, you see, okay, the Rawhide is in green on the lower part of the bar. The released bugs are in blue and released is kind of weird because it's actually from the branch date forward. So sometimes bugs get fixed between the branch and the GA. Um, there's a lot of caveats to this talk, sorry. But you can kind of look and see, all right, well, Rawhide is a relatively stable-ish percentage, right? So let's just look at the percentage. And the general trend is for Rawhide to make up a higher percentage of bugs over time, but looks like we might be starting back on a downward trend again. And if we think about it, um, you know, there's probably a relatively consistent amount of rawhide bugs we're going to find through our own internal, um, you know, testing and stuff. And a lot of a lot of rawhide bugs are more process related, you know, things like build failures and stuff like that. Um, so unless we get a lot of people running rawhide as their daily driver, we're not going to see a big increase um, in rawhide bugs. But we're seeing, you know, a drop in total bugs. So it makes sense that that's, you know, going to lead to a higher percentage in rawhide bugs. Now that we're seeing a higher number of bug reports again, the rawhide percentage goes down. One other thing is, that I kind of thought was interesting, and I don't know what to make of it, um, is just the number of components with a reported bug sometime during the release process. And I did throw rawhide in here because not every component has a bug filed it against, against it every release. And there's sort of a general upward trend, which is probably an increase in components over time. Um, but there is a lot of fluctuation. So what does that mean? No idea. But which components get the most bugs? Well, as you'd kind of expect, it's the stuff that people interact with the most. Um, if Justin Forbes is in the room, he will immediately be not surprised that kernel is in the top. Um, and a lot of the stuff is just, you know, GNOME shell. Okay, well, that's, you know, on our most used variant. So, of course, that makes sense. Um, but what's the fewest bugs? Well, almost 99% of the components have fewer than 100 bugs over the lifetime of this data set. So, from Fedora Linux 19 through 34. And if a component never had any bugs, it doesn't even show up because I don't, I didn't like produce a list of all components and shove it in. So it's basically, there's a hunt, um, you know, 99% of the component, components with at least one bug had fewer than 100 um, and almost uh, 80, or a little over 80% had less than 10. So the work is not evenly distributed. One thing I added this year um, is I just kind of wanted to see how many bug reports get reopened. Um, sometimes they're closed a little aggressively, and so somebody will reopen them. Um, this also can maybe give us a little bit of a measure of bugs closed end of life and then reopened. Um, there are reasons it's kind of hard to, to suss that out um, that I can talk about if we have time. But um, and again, this is based on when the bug was closed. So something that closed in 31 may have actually been originally opened in 26, and how do we interpret that? But anyway, there's a general downward trend, and I can think of two plausible explanations off the top of my head. One is that we're getting better at actually fixing the bugs um, and not being like, oh, oops, it's partially fixed, try again. Or it means that people have given up when the, it doesn't work the first time. Either it gets closed end of life or there's a partial fix. And they're like, you know what? I'm not even going to bother anymore. Um, one is a very happy outcome. The other isn't. And I'm not sure which it is just based on this. I'd like to think it's the happy outcome. So another thing we can look at is severity. Um, the, according to the Bugzilla documentation, severity is the user impact. Um, we also have a priority field 
which is um, basically the developer's ranking of how quickly they're going to fix it. I don't know that people always uh, use those fields the same way, but I wanted to look at it. So this is not much different from last year. Um, the urgent is a small slice, and most people never specify a severity. When they do, we kind of see the distribution you expect. Low is actually smaller. I think in terms of actual bugs, there's a lot more low priority or low severity bugs, but people maybe just don't bother reporting them. So it's kind of important to keep in mind that these are bug reports, not bugs, um, even though I will use the word bugs a lot. So for this year, I did add um, just a look at the severity over time. And the urgent, which is the bottom line in sort of the magenta, is very stable. Um, it really doesn't have a lot of fluctuation compared to some of the bigger fluctuations we've had in just the no total number of bug reports. And my suspicion here that I'm you know, going to go out on a limb and say is a fundamental truth is that we actually catch most of the urgent bugs either in our own testing or through user reports. And so it doesn't matter how many more uh, users we add, we're not going to get that many more urgent or even high severity bugs um, because we've already kind of caught those. So any additional bug reports is going to come in the medium to low severity. I think that's justifiable. So one other thing to look at, and it becomes more important as we expand our user base, is the number of duplicate bugs. And uh, you can see over time, the number of dupl duplicate bugs remains relatively steady. Um, I have some theories about uh, like the personal, like the dynamics of how people do that. And I think, you know, basically the percentage of duplicate bug reports isn't particularly correlated to the volume of reports in like certain thresholds. This is more of a, eh, I don't know. One thing that did look interesting to me is sort of how we have these big spikes. Why? Couldn't say. Um, just run through a couple tables real quick. Fewest duplicates per component. I don't know why these get fewer. Maybe they just don't get marked as duplicate because they have so many bugs. So there are actually many duplicates that never get touched. It's kind of hard to go through without spending time and like digging through the reports and actually post facto and making that determination. What I do find interesting is that 66 components, which is three more than last time, had nothing but duplicate bugs. So these are either somebody mismarked it or somebody, um, a bug was filed against another component as well. And the one in that component was marked duplicate. I don't know what to do with that other than he's like, hey, that's kind of weird. Um, so if we exclude the 100% duplicates, these are the most. Again, I, there's no real uh, meaning here that I can suss out. Uh, but it was interesting to me that unlike the previous table, where about half of the components had an increase and half had a decrease versus last year, this case, almost all the components saw a drop in their percentage. All right, so let's talk about the more interesting stuff. Bug resolution. Um, like last year, I kept the same categories. We have happy resolutions where things get fixed, essentially. We have resolutions that are sad for the user, where it's like, no, we're not going to fix that. Go away. We have resolutions that are sad for the maintainer, which are basically like, hey, you wasted my time with this bug report. What's going on? Um, and I'm excluding duplicate here because I don't think they actually add to it. And again, we can argue about which of these closure categories belong where or if there should be more resolution buckets. But for now, this is what we're going with. And we can see that over time, we're pretty consistent in our happy resolutions. Uh, but that means our sad resolutions are going up recently uh, as we uh, get more bug reports. And in fact, if you look at the percentage of bugs closed end of life, that's really bad the last few releases. Um, I don't have a great solution for how we can fix that, but it's bad user experience, and I would love to see us fix that. In part because I see, I'm the one who sees a lot of the, Fedora never fixes my bugs, I'm going to go switch to something else, you hate me, what jerks, um, complaints. Um, 
another thing that was really interesting to me is like it seems up until recently very periodic and i did some digging last year to try and figure out like how does that correlate to like rel release dates or something like you know what's the external factor and i couldn't find one so who knows so when we looked at just rawhide bugs because that was for released bugs um, as you might expect rawhide bugs are mostly happy um, because that's stuff that we've sort of filed for ourselves and are fixing but it's good to see that um, so not only is it important how we close the bug but how quickly we close the bug report so i looked at time to resolution and last year i had a lot more uh, slides i had to cut some down the jupyter notebook has a whole bunch of graphs that aren't, didn't make the cut this year um, but as you can see uh, there's a very uh, large spike at the, right at the beginning um, and the, there are i think uh, about 30 day bins or so so it's a lot of bugs vast majority of bug reports get closed very quickly um, those are probably sort of self-process kind of stuff um, but you know i graphed this on a uh, log scale before and it's very linear um, so you do see a very quick decrease um, i think a more meaningful thing is looking for the center um, so how quickly are we closing bugs over time and we are getting better um, we did have a little bit of a regression in you know 33 but the the general trend is that we are closing bug reports faster which is good now, if we look at just the happy ones so basically are we getting better at fixing them yes we definitely are and that's great to see um, but are we breaking people's hearts faster yes we're also getting way faster at uh, closing reports um, basically won't fix or you know end of life i'd say that's a good thing because then we're not languishing like their bug reports aren't languishing and people don't feel like oh no maybe it'll get fixed maybe it won't like here's the answer whether you like it or not um and i do, it's interesting to kind of look at like about the 400 day mark like that's sort of the longest a bug will be open um, before it reaches, you know, if it op was open on release day to end of life. So we're getting, you know, down to the less than a year category. I guess that's good. Uh, one thing I added also for this year was looking at our security bugs. And brace yourselves, this next slide is going to look really scary. It's actually not as scary as it looks, even though we have a huge jump in security bugs. Um, I was actually at the scale conference last weekend talking with somebody who happens to work in Red Hat's product security team, and they were telling me how uh, product security has gotten really more, a lot more involved um, in filing bugs for like every CVE um, in uh, upstream projects that are shipped in Fedora Linux. Um, and in particular, they asked about the Go ecosystem and a big chunk of uh, these reports are from the Go ecosystem. There's probably a lot more digging into this to do, uh, but you know, this isn't like, oh my God, we've just gotten really insecure. It's more that we're more aware of security vulnerabilities. And again, this doesn't break it out by, uh, by the severity, which would probably be a good addition. So how are we good? How are we doing at fixing them? Well, like non-security bugs, it's pretty pretty steady, which means we have a whole bunch more unfixed security bugs. And again, it could be that you know these things were fixed in an upstream release, and you know the maintainer added that new release and either didn't know or just didn't remember to tag that bugzilla in the new release, and so a lot of these may have been fixed up. By the work of upstream and just not been updated um, there's a whole long conversation we can have about that as well so if we look at the time to fix again we're sort of seeing a general decline that's good we're getting faster um, we like that so the last set of bugs i wanted to look at are process bugs that are so sort of a part of various development activities we have in the project um, and again, this is also new 
compared to last year. Um, and so we have bugs for uh, when a package fails to build from source. And these are often the result of changes to compilers or library packages or things like that. Um, just basically something that built no longer builds. Um, you can see it's generally fairly well distributed between um, Rawhide you know, being closed in Rawhide and being closed post branch. Um, it would be nice if more of those were fixed in Rawhide, um, particularly in that window between the mass rebuild and branch day. It doesn't happen right now. Um, yeah, more packagers are all are going to be helpful if we can do that. So how do we resolve these? And again, this is including Rawhide. Um, it turns out looks like we're only fixing about half the fail to build from source. And again, I'm hoping that this is partly an automation error or something where at some point the package does start building and the bug just doesn't, the bug report doesn't get closed. Um, somebody who knows a little more about that process, um, you know, Miro, if you're in the room or somebody from Relenge, um, you know, hopefully this isn't as sad as it looks. Uh, similarly, I wanted to look at the fail to install bugs. So that's basically the package built, but it can't install uh, because a dependency changed and won't resolve or for whatever reason. And it turns out we haven't really been tracking this meaningfully until very recently. Um, Fedora Linux 28 is the first time we actually had a fails to install tracker bug, um, which is you know kind of interesting, uh, but you can see we really just don't have many reports. And this is basically searching for the string FTI or fails to install in the subject of the bug report. So it's an imperfect measure. Um, but really, in the last few releases, have we apparently started noticing or caring about it or just gotten really bad at it? Who knows? Um, and again, we're fixing a lot fewer of these than we want, um, which you know basically puts pack these packages at risk of being dropped from the distribution because if they fail to install, they get retired eventually. Um, so another thing I wanted to look at is blocker bugs. So we have release criteria and um, you know, we go through before a beta release and the final release and evaluate, you know, does it do these things or not do these things? And we don't ship until all the blockers are resolved. Over time, we are apparently just um, getting fewer of those. I think it's hopefully because we've had a lot more um, testing. We're doing a lot more um, both manual and automated testing earlier in the process. And so we just never get to that point. Um, but we tend to accept a lot more than we reject, which I think is probably a good thing. Um, although I would actually like to see more sort of questionable blockers get proposed. Um, because I'd rather decide, no, that's not a blocker, than ship with it and be like, oh, we, we should have blocked the release on that. Um, similarly, we have freeze exceptions, which these are things where, you know, a lot of times it's a bug that ships on the live media. We don't want to um, block the release on it, but it'd be really good to fix it if we can. Uh, the rejected freeze exceptions, interestingly, are pretty stable. Um, the accepted kind of go up and down. We've seen a lot more recently, which does kind of just correlate to the gut feeling I had about it. Um, I don't know that that's good or bad. I think it does indicate perhaps a little more comfort with our testing so that we're less cautious about what we accept in terms of being a freeze exception because we're less worried that it'll accidentally break something. Uh, and then also common bugs or common issues, as Matthew has liked to point out. Um, this is basically a sort of known issues list that we generate. Um, recently started using uh, uh, for, uh, Ask Fedora to generate some of these. So it'd be really interesting to see a year from now what this graph looks like. Um, but over time, we are definitely showing fewer common bugs in general. And I don't know if this is that we're getting better at fixing the ones that we wanted to would want to highlight to people or if we're just worse at highlighting them. I think it's the former. It could be the latter. And then I just wanted to throw in the prioritized bugs 
graph, um, mostly to remind people that this process exists. Uh, there's not much meaningful to be derived from it, but I just wanted to put that in there. Uh, basically, the idea is these are for bugs, particularly post-release, um, that are just sort of obnoxious, affect a lot of people, and just sort of make us look bad that we want to try and have Matthew and I kind of lean on people a little bit more, like, hey, can we move this to the top of the stack? Um, and if the people are, uh, you know, if the maintainers happen to be Red Hat employees, then we can go to their management and say, hey, please prioritize this uh, for the person or the team. Okay, so what's next? Uh, like last year, I'll do some community blog posts with, um, you know, a summary of some of the points that I wanted to highlight, maybe a few things I left out. Um, I would love, you know, in the next few minutes later on, um, in the office hours I do on Wednesdays, uh, in the community blog comments, wherever, I'd love to know your theories about why some of these things are. Um, there will be more graphs. I will hopefully do this talk again next year and make it different enough that it's worth attending again. Uh, and like I mentioned, I'm going to unify the uh, Jupyter Notebook um, because I really, you know, it's helpful because then you can download the notebook. You can grab the CSV files out of the repo. You can make the graphs yourself and you can twiddle things if you want to focus on certain areas or just sort of interrogate uh, the data yourself. So with that, I have a couple of minutes left, and if there are questions in the Q&A, I will take them now. There are not questions in the Q&A, or at least there's no little red dot. There are not. So if you have questions, now's a great time to ask them. And if not, I'll just stand here and act silly, and hopefully whoever edits the video will cut this part out. Uh, Kevin asks, have you considered also looking at Apple bugs? Honestly, I haven't. Um, I think I talked to was it maybe Troy or Carl about it at one point. Um, that's certainly something we could do. Uh, you know, it'd be easy to, to add that. I think the longer nature of Apple makes it a little harder to react to things. Uh, Matthew asks, what data or metadata that we don't have would be nice to track in a future possible bug tracker? Um, I would love to be able to know how many times the version changed on a bug. Um, right now, that's something that can be done on an individual bug basis by just querying the bug's history. But that would mean iterating over the 300-something thousand bugs um, and you know, adding that together, that's very computationally expensive. And I feel like the uh, Bugzilla maintainers would you know, just disable my IP. Um, so it'd be really nice to be able to just get that as a field on the bug. Um, Jose asks, how could we get better information on some of the important issues you raised? Um, I don't know that we can directly. I think trying to correlate them to uh, user surveys and contributor surveys that we do on an annual basis will help. Um, starting with uh, Thor Linux 35, I've sent out um, retrospective surveys, and I haven't actually even touched the data for 36 yet. Um, this has been a very hectic summer for me personally, um, but I think trying to, you know, we pull some, start pulling some conclusions from that and sort of making reasonable inferences um, you know, based on the developer, the tester experience, um, and then, you know, user feedback to sort of see which which things we do are affecting the shape of the graphs. Uh, on our help, I'm not sure the question is, did you ever consider to check bugs that are asking improvement? I'm not sure what, what you mean by that. Oh. Um, so improving a feature in a certain software package, um, that's something that we could do. Um, I don't think it was enabled until recently, um, but Bugzilla has basically a setting for, is this a bug, a feature request, things like that. Um, but we don't have a lot of good historical data on that. Um, so it would be really hard to reliably sort out historically, you know, the difference between feature requests and you know, bugs, 
uh, versus questions and things, you know, things like that. But that is an important distinction that we don't really uh, have the ability to make at this point, unfortunately. But it looks like my time is up. So thank you everyone for your uh, attendance and thank you for the questions. I look forward to having more discussions uh, later on. Thank you.